Let us pray. Father, Lord Almighty, Father, let us seek your words today as we open up your word. Father, let us be attentive and listen, but Father, help these words be the words that you want us to hear today. And Father, let us praise and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, as we continue through the one another passages in the Bible, we'll see that our source of how to live out the one another's in the Bible is God's great love for us through Jesus Christ. No matter which one of the one another's you are looking at, love one another, or live in harmony and humble yourself towards one another so that you can live in unity with each other, we see that the only way that we can live is with God's love and be unified with one another by putting on Christ and getting rid of our old self. In other words, we should focus on God's great love for us and how he spurs us on to love one another. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment, Jesus says, the most important one answered Jesus is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. This is, there is no greater, there is no commandment greater than these. I believe if we live out these two commandments, we will be living out the one another's in our life. Today, the one that we will be addressing is forgiving one another as Christ has forgiven you. The Bible from cover to cover is God's redemptive plan for mankind because of sin that we've done against God. The Bible points us to Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We can only have forgiveness because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the Bible, we see God's love for man from Genesis to Revelation. The Bible tells us, the Bible tells us how a loving God created us, had fellowship with us, and forgave us of our sins against him through his redemptive plan of Jesus Christ. Scripture also says that Jesus will come back soon for us. The Bible is saturated from one book to the next book of the Bible, showing us God's great love and forgiveness for mankind through Jesus Christ. In every book, we can see God's plan of salvation achieved through the works of Christ on the cross. For purpose of time, we'll not go through every one of these books of the Bible and see the names of Jesus, but let, us, let me list off a few of them. In the book of Genesis, Jesus is creator, and Jesus is the promised seed of the woman who will crush the head of the serpent. In the book of Exodus, Jesus is the Passover lamb. In the book of Leviticus, Jesus is the high priest. In the book of Numbers, Jesus is the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night and the smitten rock that gives living water. In Deuteronomy, Jesus is the, the, um, the prophet greater than Moses. In Joshua, he is the commander of the army of the Lord. In Judges, Jesus is the true and final judge. In Ruth, Jesus is the kingsman redeemer. In Psalms, Jesus is the good shepherd. In Daniel, Jesus is the fourth man in the fiery furnace. In Micah, Jesus is the promised Messiah born in Bethlehem. In moving on to the New Testament, in Matthew, Jesus is the king of the Jews. In Mark, Jesus is the servant king. In Luke, he is the son of God. In John, he is called the son, I mean, in Luke, he's the son of man. In John, he is called the son of God, the word made flesh, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. In Acts, Jesus is the risen Lord that brings salvation to the world. In Romans, Jesus is the righteousness of God. In Hebrews, Jesus is the high priest and author and finisher of our faith. In 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, Jesus is truth, love, and all that is good. In Revelation, Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the Lamb slain and the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We get this from Phil Nation's Lifeway Ministry. As we see, after book after book, page after page, the whole Bible is about God's love, compassion, and grace, and forgiveness for man through Jesus Christ. Spurgeon puts it this way, our love ought to follow the love of God in 
one point, namely, in always seeking to produce reconciliation, it was to this end that God sent his son. Our love needs to follow Jesus Christ. Our love needs to follow the reconciliation that God gave us that we need to forgive others who have sinned against us too. Like I, um, like I said a couple weeks ago, and Jonathan said last week, we love one another and live in unity and in harmony with one another because of God's great display of love for man. This was demonstrated when God sent his one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for you and for me. Um, demonstrate for you and for me. Second, as Christians, our goal is to live and love in harmony with each other and in unity. And third, we are to display this love so the world can see that we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Today, as I begin, as I believe, we are going to talk about one of the hardest ones to follow, and that is forgiving one another. We all know what we need to do sometimes, but our pride and our sinful nature stops us from truly forgiving one another with our whole heart. We might see, us, we might see this as a sign of weakness when we forgive somebody. Many of us today have been hurt by someone, and you can no longer talk to that person, and you're holding a grudge against that person. When you see that person, you have bad thoughts about that person. Or when you see that person, you might just turn around and walk away from that person for you don't have to talk to this person or even deal with the situation at hand. But our theme today is God and his redemptive plan of salvation through Jesus showed us how to forgive one another as God has forgiven you in Christ Jesus. Our first point today, we have complete forgiveness available through Christ. We have complete forgiveness available through Christ. Over the last couple of weeks, we've talked a lot about God's love, loving us and being unified in Christ. So today we'll take a short period of time on this point, but let us remember, without God's love, when he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to pay for the price of my sins and for your sins and to purchase us back, to redeem us back to our Heavenly Father, we would still be trapped in our sins. We'd be still destined to hell with no solution to the greatest problem of man, and that is sin. But God gave us the solution through Jesus Christ, who came and paid the price for our sins so that we may have complete forgiveness. In Colossians 3, 12 through 14, it states this way, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you have grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forget, forgave you. And, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. God gave us the greatest example, Jesus Christ. And we should love one another as Christ loves us and as God has loved us and gave his son. In Ephesians 4, 32, it states, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. King David tells us that God's love is so great that our sins are forgiven as far as from the east is from the west. In other words, God's love and forgiveness is unmeasurable. We cannot fully grasp or understand or conceive how much God loves us and how much God has forgiven us. God's forgiveness of our iniquities comes from his great love and compassion for his people. God had every right to judge and punish us for our sins that we sinned against him, but through Jesus, he chose to love and forgive instead. We see this in Psalms 103, 11 through 14. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As, as a father has compassion 
on his children. So the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. So let us remember that our greatest example of life on how and why we should forgive is Jesus Christ. All of us have sinned against God Almighty and have been separated from God because of sin. But Jesus paid it all on the cross. So our first point today is forgive like Jesus has forgiven. To be forgiven by God means that your sins have been removed and restoration has taken place. By God's grace, gracious gift of forgiveness through Christ, any wrong you have done is not held against you. God is eager to forgive and provide forgiveness to you through faith in Jesus Christ. The scriptures, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, is full of examples of humans who have sinned against God and who have sinned against each other. I look at where Esau had to forgive Jacob when he, because he's, um, J- Esau tricked him out of his birthright. I think of Acts. I mean, I think of Stephen in the book of Acts, chapter 8. When Stephen was being stoned by the religious leaders, his words were, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Another well-known passage is Peter, who denied Jesus three times. In John chapter 21, Jesus reinstates, Jesus, uh, Jesus reinstates Peter and, asks, and gives him forgiveness. We'll not be able to cover all of these today, but today we'll talk about three examples in the Bible that one a story and two a parable, two parables in the Bible. One a story will be from the Old Testament and the other one will be two parables in the gospel that Jesus speaks as we talk about forgiveness today. In Genesis chapters 37 through 50, and no, we will not read all those today. All right. So I'll give you a quick overview of what the story is. Joseph was his father's favorite child because he was born in his old age. Jacob even made a special, richly, rich ornament robe for Joseph to wear. Later on in life, Joseph had a couple dreams in which he told his brothers that someday, basically the dreams meant that his brothers were going to bow down to him. His brothers already had a little dismay against him because he was a favorite child. But now, Joseph is saying, hey, I've had these two dreams. And you know what? In these dreams, it looks like you're going to bow down to me. His brothers did not really like Joseph at all. All right? His brothers sought ways to get back at Joseph all the way to the point one day where Jacob told Joseph to go out to the field and find your brothers and make sure that their brothers are all right and that the flock is okay. As Joseph went out looking for his brothers, his brothers saw him far off. And when they saw him, they sought the opportunity. And they plotted to kill their brother and take the robe back to the father dipped in blood. So when Joseph got close, they attacked him, stole the robe. But instead of killing him, they thrown him into a cistern. And then a group of Ishmaelites came along. And they said, why kill him? We get no money out of that. We'll just sell him and all of us will get some money. So they sold Joseph to this group of Ishmaelites. And Joseph ends up in Egypt. And he gets sold again to Potiphar. And everything that Joseph did under Potiphar seemed to be good. And Potiphar put him in second charge of everything that he had. But there was one problem. Potiphar's wife seemed to have eyes for Joseph. And one day, she tries seducing him. And Joseph flees. But Potiphar's wife yells out and blames it on Joseph that he tries seducing her. And Potiphar has Joseph thrown in jail. In jail, God was with Joseph. And Joseph moves up and gets the trust of the jailer. And then one day, two people come with dreams, a cupbearer and a baker. And Joseph was able to interpret these dreams just as they were. And later on in life, as Pharaoh had two dreams and no one could figure them out. But the cupbearer 
who is now put back in his proper position, remembered, oh, this guy in jail? You know, he was able to interpret my dreams. So they call Joseph. And Joseph was able to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh by God's will. And the dreams were there would be seven years of plentiful and seven years of famine. And when Joseph saw this, the king saw this, he put Joseph second in charge of everything. And when he had second in charge of everything, Joseph went from being in jail to be second in charge. I don't know about you guys, but every time I read this, there's a couple things that pop to my mind. This guy's have some great forgiveness to him. Because one of the first things I would have done, thinking, you know, just thinking my, myself, my sinful nature jumps in once in a while. Where's Potiphar's wife? And she might be going to jail. But Joseph doesn't do that. You see, Joseph has complete forgiveness for this person. So the point we need, we need to choose to forgive one another, not to seek revenge when wronged by others, but A, be focused on God's plan, not our circumstances. Joseph was focused on God's plan, not on our circumstances. Today, too many of us, when we're wronged, we focus on the circumstances and not on God. We focus on the pain and the suffering, but we don't focus on God. Like I said, a lot of times I read this, I ask myself, what would I have done? And the answer is very simple, how Joseph was able to do this. It's in Genesis 50, verse 19 through 21. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. To accomplish what is now being done, the, sa the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. This is right after Joseph, Jacob died. Joseph's dad died. And the brother's like, oh, you know what? Joseph's going to come and get us. You know, when this famine hit, it was so severe that his brothers had to come to Egypt to get food. They came twice, and those dreams were fulfilled. Joseph had a choice that he had to make to forgive or seek revenge. Sometimes we have to ask that question ourselves today. Are we seeking to forgive or are we seeking revenge? Joseph chose to forgive his brothers and others that sinned against him. The providence of God placed Joseph's brothers' lives and future in Joseph's hands. The lies and the cover-ups that they told about Joseph's death have finally come full circle. They could no longer hide the truth and bear the pain that they caused their father Jacob. Like, Joseph, like Moses writes in Numbers 32, 23. But if you fail to do this, you will be sinning against the Lord. And you may be sure that your sin will find you out. Their sin has found them out. Joseph chose to forgive, serving as a picture of Jesus Christ. As he gave them mercy and forgiveness. He understood that God was in control and God's perfect plan was to use Joseph to save the nation of Israel. Joseph chose to forgive instead of seeking revenge when he had a chance to repay those that have wronged him. Like I said, one of the first things I will think about in this is how would I react? Would I be forgiving? And I hope I would. I hope that I would. But Joseph is not seeking to repay evil. He's seeking forgiveness for those who have wronged him. He forgave and he moved on in life. So many times unforgiveness cripples us and does not allow us to move forward in life. People just can't get past 
the tragedies in their life and they dwell on the past instead of forgiveness of those, forgiving those who have wronged them. Today, how do we act towards those that have sinned against us? Do we seek revenge on others and have, and have, and have hurt that have hurt us? Or do we seek forgiveness? I know that this is an extreme case. His brother put him in jail. I mean, his brother sold him for slavery. He was put in jail. I know these are extreme cases. But please don't misunderstand me today. If there is a lawful offense that needs to be dealt with, yes, please go to the authorities. But don't seek revenge yourself. Allow the forgiveness of Jesus Christ to be your ultimate example of how we need to forgive one another. So when a brother in Christ offends you, are you seeking to forgive that brother the same way that Jesus forgave? Are we seeking guidance from the Lord or are we seeking revenge like the world would want us to seek to get even? As we move on to our second point today, we need to choose to forgive one another, not to seek revenge when wronged by others, but to be merciful. In Matthew 18, 21 through 20, um, 35, we find the parable of the unmerciful servant. Peter goes to Jesus and asks the question, how many times do I need to forgive my brother? This is right after Jesus states that if a brother sins against you, you need to go to your brother and show him his fault in order to help win him over. Jesus gives the three accounts. One, go to your brother and talk to him. Two, if he does not listen, bring two or three witnesses to help settle the matter. Three, if he still doesn't listen, bring it to the church. But right after this, Peter comes to the Lord and asks him, how many times? Seven times? Seven times seems like a, a big number. And Peter, some rabbis back at that time would think that you only need to forgive people three times come out of Amos 1, 3 through 13. And they think that you only need to forgive somebody three times. So Peter must have been thinking right now, you know, I'm doing pretty good. You know, I'm saying seven, not three. But Jesus comes back with an astonishing number. In the NIV and the ESV, it says 77 times. A number that would be uncountable, unmeasurable, is what he's saying. You need to forgive people all the time. Showing that Jesus was saying that we should forgive someone a countless amount of time. We also see in Luke 17, 4, where Jesus says, if a brother sins against you and asks for forgiveness, forgive him. Further, further he says, if a brother sins against you seven times a day and asks for forgiveness, forgive him. But what does Jesus teach? But what what Jesus is teaching is that we need to forgive one another as Christ has forgave us. We need to be merciful. Let's remember Ephesians 4.32. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgive each other just as Christ has forgave you. So Jesus then tells a parable about two men that owe money. Jesus starts off by saying the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wants to settle accounts with one of his servants. This man owes him an astonishing amount of money, 10,000 talents. No matter whose calculation you use, this is a large amount of money. We're talking millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in today's market. One resource said it would have taken this man 160,000 years to pay back this debt. This man was in way over his head and had no way out. His debt was way too big. He and his family and all of his belongings should have been sold and his family put into slavery until, he should have been, until they could pay back the debt. You see, his debt was way too big. He could never pay it back. So he sought forgiveness from the righteous king. And the righteous king forgave him of his debt. This is how Jesus has forgiven each and every one of us of our debt when we have turned to him for forgiveness of our sin. So let us endeavor to be like Jesus and forgive each other. This man that was forgiven had a servant who also owed him 
a small amount of money, a roughly 100 denarii. One denarii equals one day's wages. So, about, so the amount could be paid back over time. But he also did not have the money. So this unmerciful servant that had been forgiven of his great debt refused to forgive this man. He grabbed him by the throat, demanded him to pay back his debt, and would not show mercy on the servant. He also dragged him to prison until he could not pay the debt back. There were some people, some servants that saw this, and they went to the king. And when the king found out about what and how this man was unwilling to forgive this fellow servant, he told him, I canceled your great debt, but you're unwilling to cancel this man's small debt. So he said to him, you should have mercy, you should have mercy on him just as I have mercy on you. And he put him in jail. See, we need to forgive like Jesus forgave. We need to have compassion like Jesus had compassion. John MacArthur explains it this way. Let us remember that Jesus is not speaking here, um, here of the forgiveness that brings salvation, saying that God only saves those who are forgiving. That would be work righteousness. He's speaking of people forgiving each other after they experience his grace, free grace. Those who are saved, transformed, given a new nature in Christ and have indwelt the Holy Spirit generally will manifest this changed life by having a forgiven attitude. But, there's, but there will be times when we fall in the sin of for unforgiveness and the destruction, and this instruction is for those times. So guys, we need to be forgiving as Christ forgave. The great that we owe, the debt that we owed was much greater than the debt that somebody owes us. So let us be like the king and show mercy on those that have sinned against us. Let us not hold our debt or accounts against those that have wronged us and are looking for forgiveness. No matter how great the grievance is against you or how small the infraction is, forgive as Christ forgave you. As followers of Christ Jesus, let us forgive and have mercy on those that have sinned against us like Christ has forgiven you. As Christ is our example, we need to offer forgiveness. Let us focus on God's plan and be merciful for one another so that we may live in peace and harmony with one another. I know that time is running, so we'll move. We need to choose to forgive one another, not to seek revenge when wronged by others, but be accepting. In the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15, 11 through 32, we see two different responses to the prodigal son who after he came home and asked for forgiveness after he wasted all of his father's, all of his inheritance. Jesus once again gives a parable here, and I'll quickly go through it. This man had two sons. The youngest son comes to the father and says, Father, may I have my inheritance? Now, inheritance is supposed to be for when the father dies. The son then gets part of it. But this young man could not wait till his father dies to get his inheritance. So he goes to his father and basically says, Father, to me you are dead, and I only want your money. And the father gives it to him. The father gives him his inheritance. And this young man goes off and spends all of his money on wild living, partying, and all these things until he has no money left and no place to go. All the people that he partied with, they're gone. The money's gone, they're gone. And a severe famine hits. And he has no, no place to go and nothing to do. And when we see, he gets a job. And his job is to feed pigs. This unclean animal. He's joined to feed. And the text says he longs to eat the pods of the, or the pigs. In other words, he longs to eat the food that was for the pigs. This is how down and out he was. 
And finally, he comes to his senses and says, my father's servants are better off than I am. I'll go back and I'll ask the Lord and my father for forgiveness. And we have two different responses here. The first response is by the father who sees him long way away. And he is filled with compassion and ran towards him and hugged him. The father did not stop there. He told his servants to go get him a robe of distinction, a ring of authority, and the sandals for his feet. The father was restoring this young man back to his proper position, not as a servant, but as his son. The father has forgiven him. The father was restoring this young man back. He was not taking him back as a servant but was accepting him back as the son. Not only that, he also killed the fatted calf and threw a party because the lost son, the one that was dead, that he thought was dead, has now come back home. Just like in the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin, it is time to celebrate when a sinner who repents comes back to the Lord. If the story ended there, Everyone would be excited. It would be an awesome story. Not that it's not an awesome story, but there's still one more person. And that's the older brother. The party has started, the music is playing, but when, but I'm playing for the younger brother, but when the older brother comes, he comes out and asks one of the servants, What's going on? He goes, Your younger brother has come home and you're. And your father is throwing a party for him. And the older brother gets angry and refuses to come in and refuses to have anything to do with what's going on. When his father finds out, his father comes to him and talks to him. And he says, you're throwing a party for this guy who squandered all his inheritance. Everything gone. And you're throwing a party for him. I've been with you the whole time, Father. You never gave me a fatted calf. You never gave me anything. The Father says, everything I had is at your hands. Everything I have is yours. And the older brother refused to forgive the younger brother. He was focused on what the brother, brother, younger brother has done and focused on maybe the family name. How he smeared the family name. Now he's drugged that name through the mud. Today, are we like the father or are we like the older brother? Are you more like the loving father in the story of the prodigal when the person comes back and asks for forgiveness or you're more like the older brother, not willing to forgive or forget what the younger brother has done to the father and the family name. The loving father was willing and happily accepted his son back and restored him back to proper position. This is what Christ has done for us. When we repent of our sins and come back to the heavenly father through Jesus Christ, we become children of God and are redeemed back, reconciled back to God the father through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So today, let us forgive one another like God has forgiven us through Jesus Christ. Let us not hold grudges against those that have sinned against us. We must keep the big picture of the kingdom of God at hand. Let us be merciful to the ones that have, that have sinned against us, seeking the same forgiveness that we received when we sinned against God. And finally, let us be accepting as Jesus is accepting us. Today if, we have, today, if you have sinned against anyone, go and confess your sins to one another, like it says in James. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And the prayer of a righteous person is powerful. Today, if you sinned against somebody, go confess your sins. Go make it right. Today, if somebody comes to you 
and ask for forgiveness. Forgive them as Christ has forgiven you. If we're going to live out the one another's, we must be able to forgive like Christ, like God has forgiven us through Jesus Christ. Unforgiveness will destroy unity in the body of Christ. If we're going to live in unity, if we're going to live with the love of God, we must live in the forgiveness of God and forgiving one another. Let us pray. Father, Lord, Almighty, Father, help us. Help us to forgive like you have forgiven. Let us praise and honor you and give you the glory, Father. Let our hearts be open to forgive those that have sinned against us. And Father, if we have sinned to somebody, let us confess our sins to them. And let us give you the praise and the glory today. In Jesus' name, amen.